1 John chapter 4, verses 7 to 16. Dear friends, let us love one another because love is from God and everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. The one who does not love does not know God because God is love. God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent his one and only son into the world so that we might live through him. Love consists in this, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Dear friends, if God loved us in this way, we also must love one another. No one's ever seen God. If we love one another, God remains in us and his love is perfected in us. This is how we know that we remain in him and he in us. He's given to us from his spirit. And we have seen and we testify that the Father has sent the Son as Saviour of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God remains in him and he in God. And we've come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love. And the one who remains in love remains in God and God remains in him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Uh, If you open your newsletters there, there's an outline uh, on the left-hand side, some questions up on the top right so that you can spend time in your household uh, talking about something that you've heard or listened to or learnt in today's service. Uh, If I speak too quickly, uh, the sermon will be up online later today. At this point... I'm planning on not having question time after the sermon. Don't gasp uh, because it's too warm. But that gives you a reason to bar me up at morning tea or to come tonight to summer study series and ask your questions there. Uh, Let me begin with a quote. Let me begin with a quote. Uh, If you know where this quote is from, put your hand up or yell it out. True love is the greatest thing in the world. Uh, Except a nice MLT, a mutton lettuce and tomato sandwich, where the mutton's nice and lean and the tomatoes are ripe. Does anyone know where that quote comes from? Seth Gabbard, Baxter Gabbard, where's it from? The Princess Bride, one of the greatest movies ever. Greatest movies ever. Miracle Max from The Princess Bride, as he's trying to raise a bloke who's not all dead, but just mostly dead puts out that quote because he's told that the motivation for this possible miracle is love, true love. Well, such a statement has given us everything from wonderful movies like The Princess Bride through to understandings of things like chivalry, a word we don't use that often. It's been described in sonnets by Shakespeare and rock ballads by Meatloaf. It's emerged in modern theology as people have revised what we're told in God's word and it's remade everything in our society from marriage through to gender, hasn't it? God is love. Because often when you dig beneath the surface as people talk about love or true love, that phrase is lurking nearby, isn't it? God is love. That's a phrase I've heard a lot of people use. And often spoken and used in that way, God's character, God is love, becomes a blank check onto which I can write my desires, what I want. But is that actually what the phrase means, God is love? Well, that's the attribute we're going to look at today. So let me pray and let's look at what 1 John 4 has to say. Father, thanks for your word. Uh, It's living and active. As Hebrews 4 says, it cuts through our bones into our marrow. And it exposes our nature and reveals your nature. Father, thank you that in this living and active way our sin is confronted, your grace is revealed, and through Jesus we know you as you truly are and can be transformed. Father, please do that to us today as we look at this aspect of who you are. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, like I said at the start of the service, we're working through this series on the attributes of God, uh, five parts of who God is. Uh, And I want to actually just pause at the moment and just make a couple of observations about what we've been doing. 
Uh, Because it's worthwhile halfway through doing something. You actually pause and think about what you're doing, isn't it? Uh, First, I want to say that the nature of God is an inexhaustible study. Uh, You're not going to reach the bottom of it. I I plucked three books off my bookshelf, uh, all about the character of God, the attributes of God, the attributes of God, God is. I all approach this topic of the nature of God differently. And usually somewhere in the first two or three pages, they say, this is just a taster. You're never going to get to the depths of who God is. We're just tasting about who God is as a motivation to see how far we can dive into his nature and character. So the choices that I've made are just giving us a taste. There's so much more to examine. Second, because of our limitations... Uh, remember Drinda uh, last week or the week before talking last week I was talking about how small these are and how small this is uh, we're limited we're finite we're limited in how much we can comprehend and analyze aren't we how much we can organize and so uh, uh, the temptation for a bloke like me who uh, likes to organize stuff is to put all of these attributes in separate silos and then we call all of them together that's God and so we deal with separate aspects that exist side by side that ebb and flow. Sometimes God is more loving and less this, and, and they're separate from each other, but that's actually not who God is. A God's not like a Lego kit. You don't click him together with the things that come in the packet. A God is one. God is indivisible. God is irreducible. And so while we're looking at these attributes separately, okay, we, we don't put them all together and get God. God is all of these attributes, all of the time, all at the same intensity. And so keep that in mind as we look at them. Third, the attributes of God have been traditionally divided into two categories. Uh, there are those that are part of his essential eternal essence, Uh, The technical term is his incommunicable attributes. Kind of all the big eternal stuff about God that my small brain can't comprehend. Okay. Uh, The other category uh, are those revealed in his relationship with people, with his world, his communicable attributes. All the stuff that I begin to understand as I relate to God as a finite being. Uh, Gerald Bray, who writes, writes this book, says there's always been a huge amount of debate about which is which in God because we like to categorise things and then we like to debate and defend. But really it's this distinction, what God is and who God reveals himself as being. What God is and who God reveals. And the attributes that we've been looking at straddle both of those big categories. Well, just keep that in the back of your mind. Let's turn to 1 John, point two on the outline. 1 John's an interesting letter. Have your Bibles open, page 1084. Uh, We're not going to go anywhere except 1 John 4. Okay, We're going to spend time in that passage. 1 John's an interesting letter. Uh, It's written by the same John who writes John's Gospel, uh, the same John who writes the book of Revelation. Uh, Probably written about 80 to 90 AD. Very hard to date it because we're not given any kind of geographical or historical markers. He probably wrote it from a town called Ephesus. He seems to have written it to a number of house churches. Uh, He's written it, you'll see in chapter 1, verse 3, he's written it to build up the fellowship of God's mob as they hang out with God and each other. It's about God's community and it's about distinguishing that community against every other community. So there's a sharpness to this letter. There's an edge that emphasises God's mob are different and we need to know who we are. It's also a circular letter. Uh, It's kind of like a symphony. It raises musical tones and then goes off and then comes back and then goes off and it just keeps going around and around. One of the reasons why I've never been game to preach on it because it's really complicated. But at the heart of it is the topic of who God's mob are. So if you've got your Bibles there, look up at 1 John 4, verse 4. You're from God, little children, and you've conquered them, your opponents, because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. They're from the world. Therefore, what they say is from the world, and the world listens to them. We're from God. 
Anyone who knows God listens to us. Anyone who is not from God does not listen to us. From this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of deception. Who are God's mother? How are they described there in verse 4? They're little children. You know the way family likenesses work. Kind of look out over the playground at school or at morning tune, you go, oh, that one belongs to that family. They've got that nose, haven't they? Or those eyebrows or that walk. We know how family likenesses work. Well, God's mob are God's little children. And so they bear the family likeness. They look like the family they're from. Look there in verse 7. Dear friends, let us love one another because love is from God and everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. The one who does not love does not know God because God is love. Did you, did you catch the family language there? Born? Little children are born. But there's language of distinction there, isn't there? There's God's mob and there's that mob. There's this family, there's that family. There's the language of origin. God's mob are born of God and know God. And there's the language of family resemblance. It's this simple. God's mob bear the family likeness. Born of God, from God, God's little children, they show what God is like. So, so what's the family likeness? Is it a nose? Is it eyebrows? Is it an eye colour? We're told the family likeness, aren't we, in verse 8. God is what? God is love. The family resemblance is captured in that idea. God is love. And so the family displays that likeness. Did you see that there in verse 7? Let us love one another. Why? Because we're born of God. We're in God's mob. It's emphasised down there in verse 11. Dear friends, if God loved us in this way, we also must love one another. So here's the family. Here's the family likeness. What's love? Kim asked that question, didn't she? It's the important question to ask, isn't it? Because you need to know what the family likeness is if you're going to go around resembling it. I'm at point three on the outline, and, and John very clearly helps us understand what love is. Three very simple steps. First step is in verse 8, and it's repeated in verse 16. What's love? God is love. Uh, you know, the order's important. God is love. You can't reverse it. <laughs> love is God. doesn't make sense. God is love. The second step is how that love is revealed. There in verse 9. Look at verse 9. God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent his one and only son into the world so that we might live through him. Love's always got to be revealed. You can't just walk around saying, I love you and not reveal it, can you? Love must be revealed. And the revelation of God is love is contained in which person? There in verse 9. In God's son. In Jesus Christ. Only one son who is the perfect representation of God. And so that we might know what the family likeness is, God didn't keep him hidden, did he? Well, what did God do with this boy? Did you see there in verse 9? He sent him. Go and show the world the family likeness. Go and show the world what I'm like. Now, at this point, we know that love is connected with Jesus who reveals God as he truly is. And there's a consequence there in verse 9. What's the, what's the result there in verse 9? It's life, true life. It's life as God designed it way back there in Genesis 1 and 2 when he made us in his image. Uh, Now, there's a massive obstacle to that, isn't there? Because what do we know happens to every human being? They die. There's a point where every human doesn't have life. There's an obstacle there to this family resemblance being shown. And that obstacle is something called what? It's called sin, isn't it? It's the attitude and action that says, actually, I don't want to know God, I want to be God. How can I know God if I want to be him, if I want to take his job, if I want to be him in the universe? I don't want to know him because I know me and I'm God. And I'm at the centre of the universe. That's a big obstacle to knowing God, isn't it? And the outcome of that is the opposite of life, which is death. 
It's not just an obstacle, is it? It's the complete opposite. So there's a third step in understanding what this is. And it's there in verse 10 which unpacks verse 9. Look at verse 10. Love consists in this. And not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Verses 9 and 10 work together. Verse 9 is unpacked by verse 10 in a striking way. Verse 9, God is love is revealed in Jesus Christ so that God's mob can live. There's a big obstacle called sin and death. And so verse 10 shows us how that's dealt with as Jesus reveals God. Where does this love begin? It doesn't begin with Bernard loving God. I don't want to love God because I love myself because I'm God. That's what we all do. I'm never by my own nature going to want to love God because I love myself too much because I want to be God. And so love has actually got to start with God and we notice that pattern right throughout the Bible. Do you notice everywhere where humans sin, God comes to the humans, the humans don't naturally go to God. But what happens there in Genesis 3 when humans sin? He sets the pattern. They run and hide behind fig leaves. What does God do? God comes to find them. It starts with God. It consists in a person. Who's the person? Jesus. If you want to know the shape of love, it's the shape of Jesus who reveals God's love and deals with the obstacle that stops us knowing God. He was sent to reveal God, and when he revealed God, what did he do there in verse 10? He stood in front of us and took all of God's judgment at our aspirations to be God, all of God's judgment on our sin. Jesus stood in front of us and took that for us. That's what propitiation means. He stood in for us. It's really striking, isn't it, that love confronts sin. God's love confronts sin and deals with it in right judgment. And God himself has got to do this because who's sin committed against? It's committed against God. Love had to start with God. It couldn't start anywhere else because God's the one offended. And notice that God does this at the very moment we're doing what? Seeking his job. Seeking to be God instead of him. The Bible's got a word for such love. What what is it? It's grace, isn't it? At the very moment we're seeking God's job, God approaches us so we can know him and have that obstacle of sin removed. That's profoundly other person centered, isn't it? Profoundly other persons, not not other friend person centered, but other enemy centered. And then it enables those who receive this revelation and obstacle removal, it enables them to live because their sin has been dealt with. Now, we've covered a lot there, haven't we? And it's quite warm. So let me just quickly recap where we've been before we go to our last point. A God's mob are from Him, they're His little children which means they bear the family likeness, they're to love each other. The family likeness is God is love. That love is revealed by God in Jesus Christ. That love, as it reveals God, removes the barrier of us knowing God, which is sin. And it's in the shape of Jesus Christ alone. So here's our summary. Love is from God by his initiative. Love is publicly revealed and displayed in Jesus Christ alone. Love confronts sin rightly and deals with it. Love is gracious, coming to those who don't deserve it, and it's profoundly other person-centred at great cost. Oh, that's neat. There's five fingers. That's love. Now, we've already got the command... I'm at point four on the outline. We've got the exhortation to love one another. It's a command we're familiar with, isn't it? We know that command. I mean, you'd expect God's mob gather. We, we say that every week, love each other. It makes sense 
if we're bearing the family likeness. Uh, but we need to dig down into that a little further because it, it's really striking how this love works. We're, we're going to look at verses 12 to 16. And this love is discriminating. It's striking in John that John tells God's people to love each other. Other parts of the Bible talk about loving the world. But here we're talking about the family likeness. It's discriminating. It's how we love each other as the family, God's mob. And as that happens, look at verse 12, because more stuff emerges. No one's ever seen God. If we love one another, God remains in us and his love is perfected in us. Did did you catch that? This is the most perfect expression of God's love in Narrabra. This mob gathered. Did you see that? God's love is perfected in us. That changes the gathering of God's people, doesn't it? This is the natural end point of the love of God. This group of people gathered. Look around. It's remarkable that God might say, in us, my love is perfected. So so what does that mean? Well, look around. It's an unlikely bunch, isn't it? You're all sinners. And sinners by nature want to be God. So, So you've got 120 gods in a room together who all want to be boss. And somehow God has brought all of those 120 gods together. And not only has he brought them together, but he's dealt with their death and their aspirations to be God so that somehow they're a perfect representation to the world of what God's like. That makes the gathering of God's people far more wonderful and serious, doesn't it? Far more grave and joyous. What else would bring this bunch of people into one room together? Nothing else. Uh, That reflects the nature of God, which is the love that finds his enemies and brings them together. But it goes even further, doesn't it? Uh, Because you notice in verse 12, uh, no one's ever seen God. But when this mob gathers, here's a living, breathing example of God in this town. If you want to go and see what God is like, you go and see God's mob gathered. John Chapter 13, verse 35, where Jesus says, love each other, and by this all the world will know that you're in my mob. (laughs) You bear the family likeness. Such a love is only possible when God actually comes and dwells with his people. Look there in verse 13. Remember we talked about Trinity, and this is how we know that we remain in him and he in us. He's given to us from his spirit. We, We wouldn't naturally gather together, would we? But because God gathers us and hangs out with us, we can exist. As such a mob is a public display of who Jesus is. Look there in verse 14. We've seen and we testify that the Father has sent the Son as Saviour of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God remains in him and he in God. When God's mob gather, we proclaim something. What do we say? Jesus is God's Son. We confess it. We testify and then we live it. We proclaim it and we practice it. And that's a display of the nature of God shown in Jesus Christ. There's a lot going on there, isn't there? Which brings me to point five, the last point. Love. True love. God is love. Actually, it's better than an MLT, isn't it? They're words and phrases that drive so many songs, so much theology, so many life paths, so many movies, but we've just understood God is love, haven't we? Here it is again, five fingers. God is love starts with God. God is love is revealed in Jesus Christ alone. God is love confronts sin rightly and truthfully. God is love is gracious. God is love is profoundly other person centered at great cost and it creates this mob. So tomorrow morning when it's even hotter on Monday, what will that look like? First, please get God is love straight. It's not a blank check for you to be you. Because if it was, you'd want to be God. It's not a blank check for any type of amorphous, mushy or unclear behaviour. 
God is love is concrete, historical, and thoroughly clear. It's in the person of Jesus Christ. So here's a suggestion. Next time someone tells you God is love, ask them what it means. And then share with them how good it is. We need to get it straight. Second, we must define God is love by what shape? The life, death and resurrection of Jesus Christ alone. Four sins. He's not just a good example. He's not just a really big hug for where you are in life. He is the son of God who confronts your nature and reveals the character of God. He's the only one who's ever done it. That is the Jesus we proclaim and that is the Jesus we practice. Can I ask you a question? Do you know him like that? Do you know that Jesus? Third, God is love doesn't excuse sin. It doesn't justify sin. It doesn't ignore sin. God is love confronts sin and then it deals with it justly and graciously. Are we a community that shows that? Do we confront sin? Do we reflect the nature of God as we do? Not on the warpath but seeking sinners even in the midst of God's people and by grace bringing them back to Jesus. Is that who we are? Is that how we reflect the nature of God? Fourthly, God is love is profoundly other person centered. Uh, one of the things I loved about Kim's talk is that all those yellow sheets were all other person centered. You can't do them on your own. Oh, I can give myself a meal, but that's just greed in some sense, isn't it? It's not love. It's profoundly other person centered. And notice that it's profoundly other person centered in the nature of God at what cost? At great cost. Such love is at least making meals, doing coffee and hospitality. But it's also walking with each other in fellowship so we know who better? We know Jesus better. God is love. It's really much better than an MLT, isn't it? Let me pray. Father, thanks for your word. Uh, it's hot. It's hard to concentrate. Uh, that is a very pithy phrase of three syllables, but it is so rich and wonderful. Father, thank you that your love is perfected here in all of these different people gathered in one room proclaiming publicly who your son is. Father, help us to display the family likeness that is God is love. In Jesus' name, amen.